Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is a National Park Service Chesapeake Gateways Network chat and information session. Um, we're excited today to have um, some of our partners here to share about grant funding opportunities that are open right now and that we really want to make sure all of our partners across the network are aware of and, and think about um, applying for. My name is Wendy O'Sullivan. I'm the superintendent for the MPS Chesapeake office. Uh, we have a team here that's um, presenting the chat today. And um, really, it's going to be um, two parts where the um, our partners are going to share about the funding opportunities. Um, Eddie Gonzalez, who's our head of director of partnerships and grants, will kick it kick it off. And then the second part will um, really be an open Q&A to really engage all of those that are on the call in talking about the opportunity, <clears throat> the ideas that folks have for their projects. Um, so we've asked people to say hello in the chat and to put some of your um, project ideas that you've been thinking about in the chat so that we can use those to help drive the Q&A conversation later. So um, this is part of an effort that our office is doing to really gather the network, make sure that opportunities are being brought forward. And um, we do have some news to share for those that um, were aware, we had a grant opportunity that opened and closed um, in January of this year. It was very successful. We're so thankful for everyone that was interested. Um, so successful that uh, we had over 90 applications come in for that grant opportunity, which means we really want to make sure that our partners are aware of other funding opportunities, because while we're going to be able to um, go through the process to review and select projects to support, there'll be many, many that were not able to fund this round. So we see this as um, a potential opportunity for partners that took time to apply for the MPS Chesapeake grants to now sort of pick up your package that um, that you worked on for that and bring it into this grant opportunity as well so that we're, we're trying to make sure we're bringing all opportunities forward um, as, as we partner across our different Chesapeake um, agencies and organizations. So with that, um, I'm gonna pass it to Eddie to, to get us started. Thanks all. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, she mentioned I'm Director of Partnerships and Grants for the uh, MPS Chesapeake office. So a lot of what we're doing uh, within our division is thinking about where there's networks out there to tap into, uh, where there's uh, folks doing this kind of work uh, that really need to know about these resources. I'm going to uh, just bring a little bit of context to the presentation before we get to our featured speakers. Uh, for us, you know, it really all comes back to the Chesapeake Bay Initiative. This is the law that created our office. Uh, and the piece in blue is, is what really drives a lot of these activities uh, that you'll hear about. Uh, you know, as an office, we shall provide technical and financial assistance in cooperation with other federal agencies. You know, we have a charge to not just provide direct support, but find where there's uh, other resources out there that we can help uh, connect you to. Uh, this presentation also fits within our strategic direction, within our strategic plan, uh, we have a strategic goal to strengthen strengthen the network. Uh, so that's folks that are uh, like you that are out there working in telling the stories of the Chesapeake. You know, our goal as an office is to uh, facilitate those collaborations among you. Uh, and then also within our strategic plan, we have a theme uh, to rebuild the core network capabilities and services. So these are all the functioning pieces of what uh, of the people that are out there doing this work. So we provide and leverage tangible support. We convene and facilitate networking among op among op among partners. Those are things that you should start uh, seeing more of coming out of our office. Now we will uh, hear, you'll hear more about this in future webinars. But we are starting to reference a lot the network. You know, for us the network is a network of places and their partners. It's everybody within the watershed that's telling the rich uh, diversity of stories that the diverse the the watershed holds. Uh, so we want to be an asset uh, to the folks that are in the network. The challenge for us is that uh, the watershed is big, uh, and there's a lot of variety, a lot of diversity, a lot of folks telling stories, a lot of folks that have yet to start telling their stories. 
Uh, so we really look need to look at a number of different tactics to get uh, to support such a, a wide landscape. Uh, from our office, you know, again, you'll start hearing more about these as the year progresses. But we, Wendy mentioned our first year doing the uh, grant opportunity. Uh, we also still continuing to invest in direct uh, uh, cooperative agreement relationships. Uh, we're starting to do a lot more advising on projects or advising on programs or efforts. Uh, we're, we're hoping to do a lot more convening of conversations. Uh, we're working on a branding and communication strategy uh, that partners will be able to access through our office. This webinar is part of a uh, regular series of webinars that we're going to start putting out, uh, as well as an annual training and a gateway community workshop, which will zero in resources down at a, at a, a coordinated community level. So as an office, these are the things that we're working on behind the scenes. Now, the good thing about our office is we don't do it all just within the confines of the Park Service. We do have other partnerships that we're connected to through the Chesapeake Bay Program and the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership. That opens us up to a huge series of additional partners to tap into. The, leading us into this webinar, we're happy that we do participate in the Chesapeake Bay Program that gives us access to some of our partner lead federal agencies. And today we're gonna hear from two of those components, Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which is the nonprofit partner of Fish and Wildlife Service. So that is some context for today's presentation. I'm happy to turn it over to Mike Slattery uh, with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and Joe Tulin uh, with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to talk to us, talk to us about their grant opportunities. Take it away. All right, thanks, Eddie. Appreciate that uh, lead in. Um, you know, as was said, I put in the chat, my name is Mike Slattery and I'm the Northeast Regions Landscape Conservation Coordinator for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and um, I thought I would just start by setting the stage a bit. Uh, we get the question frequently, um, you know, why, what made Chesapeake Wild come into being? Um, it, was, it was enacted um, in 2020. Uh, so it was an authorization from Congress. And the reason for it um, is because as wonderful and powerful as our Chesapeake Bay Program partnership is that EPA led and, and directed partnership is, um, there is a um, significant uh, dominating um, culture and set of activity that surrounds the total maximum daily load process and the need, very important need for nutrient sediment load reduction. And as significant as all of the funding that goes along with that through the Chesapeake Stewardship Fund has been over the years, um, it was becoming increasingly difficult to discuss aligned conservation and restoration priorities in that context for their inherent value. And not only when they um, arise through efforts to address nutrient sediment loads, nutrient sediment load reductions. So there was an interest in generating Chesapeake Wild so that we could begin to work across the entire watershed as a collective collaborative conservation partnership, not to add a whole bunch of new structure, but really to zero in on those shared priorities for fish, wildlife, habitat, outdoor, um, equitable access to the outdoors, those kinds of priorities that are very much related to the Chesapeake Bay program's priorities, but have inherent value on their own and unique value on their own and begin to build cohesion around that and also operate a grant program if, when appropriations happen for it, which they have, operate a grant program to begin paying for work done by the partners collaborating to address those priorities on the ground through a grant program. So that's that's why and how it came into being and that's why we are here today. So um, with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Joe so he can introduce himself and talk about some of the foundational elements of the stewardship fund. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Joe Tolan. I'm the manager of Chesapeake programs here at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go into the background about um, NIFWIF. And then um, Mike will kind of take over again in a little bit to talk more specifically about the wild program priorities this year and, and kind of what we're looking for. So if you could go to the next slide. 
Uh, so, you know, as a as a Chesapeake based stewardship fund kind of group here, uh, we have a lot of different partners that we work with. And so you'll see on the slide, um, EPA, Chesapeake Bay Program, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we have our corporate partner that's the biggest for our work is Altria. And then we get funding from USDA and the Forest Service as well. And, you know, our program really kind of functions in a couple of different buckets. We have our competitive grant program, which is what we're going to talk about today. We also have some of the kind of directed grant support for really critical networking and infrastructure um, and kind of capacity building in the region. Um, and then a kind of a separate last bucket being some technical assistance support that we provide uh, mainly through our field liaisons. But really the, the goal of that is to um, ensure that folks who are trying to access our funding kind of have ways to do that um, kind of broadly. Um, and so next slide. And so um, again, what we're gonna talk about today is our kind of currently open um, grant programs right now. And so the Small Watersheds Grant Program is one that we've had for quite a while at this point. Um, it's delivered in partnership with EPA and the Bay Program um, specifically. And this year we're expecting, you know, maybe up to 25 million available in this particular program for implementation and for planning and technical assistance grants. And then we'll talk about the WILD program, Watershed Investments for Land Defense, which again is in partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And in this particular program, we're expecting probably about 8 million um, for, for this round of the program available um, this year. So next slide. So just to kind of see it on a table, um, there's a couple of different tracks you can apply for in this particular program. And I think this is helpful to summarize, um, you know, what you could apply for where. And so, for both programs, you have an implementation track and you have a planning and technical assistance track. And so for our small watershed grants for implementation, you're looking at about $75,000 to $500,000 um, and you do not need match. Um, we would like to see it if you can bring it, but it is not required for this program, which is you know, a little bit unique for the programs that we run here at NIFWF. Um, and then there's a planning and technical assistance track, which goes up to $75,000. And then for WILD, um, you'll see that the funding range is a little bit higher actually. So you can go up to $750,000 in the WILD program. Um, match is required for the WILD program. However, through um, the creation of this program, um, it was determined that you can use federal match for up to 50% of your total match requirement, as long as it is a not Department of Interior source. So if you have a project that does have EPA funding as a match, or has NOAA funding as a match, just as two examples, that can help kind of get you towards that match requirement for this program. And then there's a planning and technical assistance track as well, um, which is up to $75,000. So next slide. Um, and you can see a table here of kind of all of the eligible applicants. So I, I, saw, I saw a lot of the groups in the chat that are here. Most of you all are eligible for these programs. Um, you will see that the WILD program actually does have a little bit of additional eligibility. So, you know, if you're in another federal government agency, you actually are eligible for the WILD program. Um, and um, yeah, so you can see this chart here. It's also in the RFP um, to find out more. So next slide. And then I just wanted to highlight some of the joint program priorities and, and a goal of the stewardship fund here is to kind of increasing direct and meaningful engagement in communities that we're working with across the Bay. A lot of times we're gonna see this through underserved communities or communities we haven't reached before. Um, and there's a couple of, of ways that you can get at that. And so one of the pieces that we like to see in, in projects that come into our program are that you're really co-creating these projects with the community members. So from the beginning, from the planning stage, um, you know, you're involving community members and seeking their input in the work that you're doing definitely empowering community members to make those decisions. So not just bringing them to the table, but asking for their input and asking for what they wanna see. Um, obviously, even in the project team, it would be really great to see that community members are gonna be involved in that work. Um, and that kind of leads to the active engagement strategies, which are you know workshops, classroom activities, field trips, volunteer opportunities. And we like to see those over you know the more passive engagement because there is more buy-in. So, you know, passive engagement might look like telling the community what you want to do versus getting their input. Um, projects that address kind of specific localized harm in different areas are going to, you know, score well in our in our program. 
And then um, if you're creating jobs within the communities that you're working in, again, that's a really great way to see that there's community support and community buy-in. And so this is gonna be a priority across both programs that we're gonna talk about today. And so that's why we, we kind of bring it to the top here. And I'm actually gonna go ahead now and you can go to the next slide and pass it back to Mike to share a little bit more about the, the Chesapeake Bob program. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, as you can see here, um, and as the name implies, uh, there is a strong focus on fish and wildlife habitat here. Um, if any of you are familiar with the, um, with the framework for the partnership and the program that was developed together with a broad array of stakeholder input, um, you'll be familiar with what we call these five pillars. Um, we've gone back and forth a bit because you know, it shows here that there are four pillars holding up one big area of emphasis. That's kind of true. It's not, not quite completely true. The, there are five pillars, and this is just trying to emphasize that really it all passes through a lens of the value added to connected, resilient fish and wildlife habitat, both land and water that benefits fish and wildlife resources and people. So the equitable access to the outdoors piece is that very definitely a part of that, as are the others. Uh, but it all goes along with a. It, it's looking through the lens of uh, connect interconnected network of fish and wildlife habitat that provides access to people. Right. So um, that's uh, why we have portrayed it this way. Um, and uh, the other key elements here <coughs> can be and usually are integral to any project that would be proposed that would uplift uh, fish and wildlife habitat values, equitable access values, they would all have or should have uh, elements of climate change responsiveness, uh, you know, community engagement and, and community sustainability. Um, as I mentioned earlier, equitable access to the outdoors for people to become um, more engaged with the work that we do and become healthier in those spaces. And of course, clean water, um, but not only clean water for clean water's sake, but clean water in as much as it provides um, excellent living uh, conditions for fish, wildlife, and people, right? Uh, and the community partnerships piece is, is one that we've paid quite a lot of attention to and are emphasizing very strongly uh, because um, it has become increasingly evident to us that the most powerful and durable investments through the program that we can make are when right at the very beginning, right at the ground floor, we are engaging with representatives of communities in the receiving areas to hear from them just exactly what it is they need and expect from us. And so that's become a really critical part of, of the work that we're doing and trying to fund. So next slide, please. Um, the priorities, just to put a little bit finer point on, on these, are, as was mentioned, fish and wildlife habitats. Uh, the connectivity concept is really important here. It's not, not that we're interested in funding a bunch of one-off projects and opportunity-driven activity to address the needs of uh, fish and wildlife species that are in greatest need of it. Uh, but rather that we're building over time toward a connected system of land and water habitats that um, taken together can support sustainability of most of the species that A, need it, and B, the people who live in, in and visit the watershed care most about, right? So uh, that's a very important part of this and even an overriding part of this. Um, and, uh, and then along with that, there is an important element uh, that we're focused on building capacity for tribal and indigenous conservation stewardship and enhancement of fish and wildlife habitat. You know, we are um, increasingly engaging with tribal nations as we undertake this work and are really pleased with the response that we've had even in our inaugural year for that. Uh, the climate change piece, protecting and enhancing nature-based resilience for critical habitats, you know, that takes a variety of forms. We're not, we're not at saying that absolutely every proposal needs to be centered on climate change adaptation, uh, but we, we want to have it be increasingly recognized by the people we're working with that all of the work that we do should consider 
climate change adaptation and community resilience as a component of the projects that we're proposing to fund and, and proposing to do if you're on the, on the uh, grantee end of the spectrum. Next slide. Uh, community partnership piece, I've, I've mentioned that already, uh, how important it is to get communities engaged on the ground floor. What I didn't um, stress when I talked about this earlier is that um, it is um, uh, quite apparent, we're hearing it each and every day, that there is a lack of capacity uh, within even you know, the, the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is so um, rich and rich by partner capacity, there is a lack of specific kinds of capacity uh, for the kinds of organizations that we're hoping to engage in this work um, to rely on. So we're hearing that, they're, you know, the, that our partners are and our stakeholders are capacity limited. We wanna really figure out how we can do better answering that call from them to help them build capacity to have access to not just the granting program, um, but capacity to more fully engage in the community of practice of conservation and restoration within the Chesapeake watershed. So we're really interested in building that part out. And then of course, public access, maintaining uh, and, and really enhancing um, the access that already exists in the watershed, but doing it uh, in a way that increases public uh, awareness, that increases the economic and educational value, um, you know, really builds upon the success of what has come before and looks to new and innovative ways of engaging with those who would um, like to visit, engage with, uh, enjoy the outdoors more and in different ways than we've conceived of that in the past um, to bring those communities in, into the fold, if you will. Um, so that's a, an important wrinkle here. And one of the things that I think will resonate with this group um, is that where we have started discussions already, since we have our own funding lane now with Chesapeake Wild. And as you heard from Wendy earlier, there's been a huge response to um, the renewed call for the um, uh, Gateways Grants Program, how we can begin to interweave these programs so that we can accelerate and amplify uh, the impact that we're having with the communities that each is intended to serve. There's a lot of overlap there. And so just being, you know, attuned to what would make for good government, we want to we want to see how we can build those things together over time. Um, so is that all for me or is there a next slide for me? One more. One more. Okay, great. Oh yeah. Water quality. I shouldn't have overlooked that one. It's the one that, as, as I said, is predominant in the, um, in the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership. And that's as it should be. Um, again, this is really what we're, what we're trying to do is not to do more of the same, but to do more where the value added can be really finely focused. Uh, so this is improving water quality for imperiled species of fish and wildlife. Um, it's not, you know, it's not only that we're looking to uplift water quality conditions for endangered species or those that are um, regional species of greatest conservation need that we in the states have identified together and are worthy of our conservation attention. Yes, it is those things, but we're specifically and strategically choosing what species we will highlight carefully so that they can represent the needs of other species, of species more holistically uh, as we go about that business. So, you know, we know that there are lots and lots of species in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We can't work on them uh, all at once, everywhere, all the time, um, but we can be more thoughtful in how we choose which of them we will invest in, work on, so that while we do that, there will be benefits accrued by a bigger and bigger set of species that um, will benefit from the investments that we make as they're connected over time. So. Uh, that's it for me, and now I'll hand it back over to Joe. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm going to go over, you know, a little bit quick, a little bit more quickly, I guess is the best way to put it, the, the priorities for the Small Watershed Grants Program. Again, this program has been around for a while, and we're really excited that we can fund kind of some new um, things, including like public access being a big point through the WILD partnership. But um, for the Small Watersheds Program, um, the priorities are um, maintaining agricultural and urban runoff, um, and that's been kind of a core for a lot of NIFLIS programs for a long time, um, improving water quality, 
Mainstream health through riparian restoration and conservation, specifically um, enhancing and protecting freshwater habitat for eastern brook trout. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the species that might be a better fit under the small watershed grant program in, in just a minute, because there are certain species that through the Bay program have been um, uplifted, and, and that's where they could fit in the small watershed grant program a little bit more closely. Um, Protecting and enhance and tidal and estuarine habitat is a fit under the small watershed program. You'll see that kind of nature-based resilience is a theme here as well. Um, and while it was more focused on um, kind of fish and wildlife species under wild, if you're doing that work and, and really looking at human communities, it's actually a really good fit under the small watershed program. Um, and then again, building capacity for landscape scale habitat planning, design, and implementation. And, with the kind of additional funding that's available um, through the infrastructure law, um, we'll see that, you know, we really can put a lot of funding also directly towards that kind of planning and technical assistance piece, which is, is really exciting. I know I've been on calls even that, that got funded last fall and people that just hadn't really had a dedicated pot of funding to go to were able to get planning and technical assistance awards. And so that is a big piece of the work that we're doing here. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. And so this is a little bit small on the screen, but this is its own document that's available, but it just kind of breaks down, you know, which program you should go to if you have, you know, different types of projects. And so, you know, if you're, you know, doing watershed restoration and water quality improvements that are more specifically doing nutrient and sediment reduction, you're going to look at the small watershed grant program. If it's for, you know, improving habitat for um, threatened or imperiled species, you're going to do the Chesapeake Wild Program. Um, another example here, um, just being, um, there are a couple of things that you can go to the WILD program for that you can't go to the Small Watershed Grant program. And so um, I just wanted to uplift, um, if you're doing land conservation projects where you need direct funding for um, land conservation, you actually can do that through the Chesapeake WILD program, which is something we hadn't been able to fund before with the Small Watershed Grant program. Um, the public access piece is a good fit under the WILD program. And then um, if you're doing work to, to do building of tribal and indigenous capacity, um, I would also recommend the WILD program. And then there are some species, like I had mentioned before, that the Chesapeake Bay program has kind of uplifted in their watershed agreement um, as species that um, are of greatest concern for them. And so those species, one of them being the brook trout that we've already talked about, the American black duck and oysters, for example, those are all a better fit for the small watershed grant program because of the partnership with the Bay Program. But then other imperiled and endangered species uh, definitely would be a better fit for the for the Chesapeake Wild Program. So just parsing that out a little bit. And if you're not sure, even after reading through this, you're definitely welcome to reach out to us and we can have the conversation about, you know, where your proposal might be a better fit. So next slide. I did want to just highlight a couple more resources that are, are new this year um, for the, the programs as you're looking to kind of submit your applications. And so um, the first piece being um, a metrics guidance document. And so we know when you go into our online system, uh, there's a whole bunch of metrics you can choose for your project. Uh, we definitely don't want you to choose all of them. We just want you to choose the ones that, you know, really um, can kind of show the overarching goals of your program. Um, but there is this guide now that exists to kind of walk you through what we're looking for, because some of them might have similar names or there, there's a little bit of nuance in how you're going to enter those in our system. And so that guidance document is available. The quick reference guide that we just showed is its own PDF, and that's available on our website. And then finally, we have a toolbox available for a whole bunch of different resources and a whole bunch of different kind of areas that could help you with this. And so, you know, there's a couple of, of uh, tools on there to look at um, endangered and imperiled species. There's some tools in there talking about um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and how to use environmental justice screen or EJ screen when you're looking at maybe applying for our program and you need that for your proposal. And so there's just so many resources in that particular toolbox that are available to you that we've tried to consolidate into one, you know, document. Um, and the last resource that isn't up here, but that we always talk about is that um, we have field liaisons that kind of help support some of this work as well. And so you can find all of their contact information in our RFP, but there are um, five of them kind of positioned across the watershed with some different areas of expertise. 
Um, and so, especially as we get closer to the deadline, I know um, my time is starting to get a little bit limited, but having those five people that can help with general project questions um, is definitely a way to go to help get some of your questions answered. Uh, next slide. So this is just the, the overview of the timeline. So both of these programs are due on uh, Thursday, April 20th um, at 11.59 p.m. So please make sure that you are going in and you're um, starting those ahead of time. We definitely don't want um, any last minute calls if we can avoid it. Um, I know that we have um, the America the Beautiful program actually also closes on April 20th. So, um, you know, there are a couple of other programs that are closing that night. So definitely I recommend applying early if you can. Um, we will do the review in May um, and these uh, will go to our board in August. Um, and we look to make um, our board notifications uh, in August or um, yeah, in August and then kind of do an official announcement in September. Uh, so next slide. And so um, I did want to highlight kind of two other programs that um, are um, available for funding right now in the Chesapeake region. Um, and so the first one being the America the Beautiful Challenge, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard about. Um, this particular program, they opened their RFP earlier this month. As I mentioned, their proposals are also due on April 20th. Um, and so I would just say, um, we can definitely talk about kind of the ways in which our programs can work together. Um, but the America the Beautiful Challenge, you know, they specifically are looking at aquatic grassland and forest restoration, wildlife corridors, ecosystem and community resilience and public access. Um, they're expecting to have available about 116 million this year in, in this particular program. Um, and the two contacts for that program are Rachel Dawson, Dawson and Sydney Godby, who are on the, their contact information is on the slide. I would say for this particular program, the big difference being um, if you're, because it's a national program, uh, there's a lot more competition for it. So just for kind of scale, um, they had over 500 applications come in the first year of the program. They were only able to fund about 10% of those projects. And so it is a very competitive program. And so if you're if your project is a good fit under the two programs that I've already discussed, I definitely would recommend starting there. Um, and then if you need a larger amount of funding maybe than is available in our programs, then you might wanna look at the America the Beautiful Challenge, but it's just a very competitive program because it is national. Uh, next slide. And then the other program that also funds in our region um, is our National Coastal Resilience Fund. Um, and so this program you know, is really for nature-based solutions. Um, to reduce the risk of coastal hazards to communities that enhance habitat for fish and wildlife. Again, this is a national program. It is typically very competitive. Um, and so um, again, if, you're, if your project um, is a good fit under potentially the Chesapeake Wild Program um, and you can fund it within the caps of the Chesapeake Wild Program, I would definitely recommend starting there first um, and then maybe looking for this program after the fact. Um, but um, for this program, um, they don't actually have a cap on the award size. So, you know, we're seeing that um, the planning and technical assistance, you know, typically around $100,000 for that track. And then for um, implementation, maybe even up to 10 million or more. Um, and they have a lot of funding available this year. So they, they're they expecting to have about 140 million available in that program this year. Um, and these, they have a pre-proposal due April 12th. So just keep that deadline in mind too, because that's coming up. Um, and this year for the Mid-Atlantic region, if you're interested in applying, um, Stephanie Heidbreder is actually the contact person to go to. Um, many of you might recognize that name because she was previously in my role and she got promoted up and out, um, but she's helping them this year with, um, with their proposals as well. So um, those are just two other programs that fund in the Chesapeake region that are also open right now. And so I wanted to highlight that they are available. Um, and that is all the slides that we have. Um, so we're, we have a lot of time here that we can help kind of field any questions that folks might have about their project ideas or questions to clarify anything. Um, and we really wanna hear from everyone on the call. Yeah, let's open it up for any sort of clarifying questions. We've been capturing the projects that um, have been shared in the, in the chat and so Farron is is looking through those but anything that any clarifying questions that folks have 
to start off because that's a, that's a good amount of information. There's also some links that have been popped into the chat, taking you to some of the tools and documents and resources that were that were shared. So you can throw up a hand, pop it in chat. I can start here if that's okay. Yeah. Go uh, for it. My name's Jen Tisa and I'm from the Lancaster Conservancy. And I was just wondering how you define planning versus implementation. Some grants include design and engineering and planning and some put that in implementation. Um, so I was wondering for the wild grant specifically, how that works here. Yeah, so for, for our programs in particular, um, design engineered plans and that piece of it, are typically going to go under the planning and technical assistance track. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, if you have, you know, design plans already started and you need a little bit of funding maybe to just finalize them, you know, you could potentially come into the implementation track as well. Um, but for the implementation track, we really are looking for projects that are pretty much ready to be implemented um, soon after that funding kind of goes out the door. So, um, I would say the planning and technical assistance track is probably the better track if you're looking for those kind of engineered plans. And and I know Mike, you came off mute, so I don't know if you have anything to add. To no, that. I was just ready ready to add if there was something that I thought needed adding, but it's covered it. Well, I'll jump in. And hello, folks. I'm Jake Riley with um, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. I work with Joe. Um, it's a great question, and yeah, just further clarifying kind of Joe's point. The important thing to think about is the. Proposals submitted under the implementation track, there is an expectation that those projects are going to yield direct and measurable conservation or restoration actions on the ground, right? So, and, and that is a principal evaluation criteria for those kinds of, of projects. It is often the case where folks will bring us implementation proposals that might have planning, design, engineering, capacity building components but are also helping to sort of actually result in direct implementation of, of action. So that would be sort of the, the, the hook, I would say, is if you're thinking about that implementation track, you're going to need to be able to demonstrate to us um, some consequential sort of conservation or restoration outcomes from the, from the project and sort of the project period that you're looking at. That's very helpful. Thank you. There's a question in the chat about, um, are there grants that would be appropriate for developing public education while on boat charters? So of the different opportunities that we've reviewed, is there one that would that would slot into? Yeah, I think um, it's, it would probably be a better fit under the small watershed grant program. Um, I, I think that if there are ways to kind of um, kind of tie this project into some of the other priorities under the, the small watershed grant, it would make it more competitive. Um, but I'm thinking it probably would be a better fit under the SWIG program. I don't know, Mike, if you had any feels about that one. No, not really. I think it's a good answer. I think that that's right. One, one thing to keep in mind is just clarifying that uh, for profits are generally not eligible for most of the programs. Um, and certainly, you know, depending on sort of the charter business, I think one of the things that we would sort of look for in a proposal like that would be um, how, how you're partnering with other organizations, communities, especially, you know, in that sort of education public access component how you're looking to sort of make that kind of opportunity available to maybe folks in communities that traditionally have not had those kinds of opportunities to get out on a boat, so. Yep. So some of the project examples that came into the chat, um, let's see, let me just grab one of these. We have one that, I'm gonna go with water quality, Mike, since you <laughs> you almost <laughs> forgot that that slide was there. Yeah. Um, one of them is looking to expand current water quality testing and implement more formal testing systems um, and looking to build several public education programs around it. And it looks sounds like the, the part that they'd need grant support on is that public education component around it. Where do you see that fitting in? That certainly um, can and ought to be a good fit. I think that a critical 
consideration there is going to be um, the nature of the education that is the context for how that is to be undertaken, you know, and, and uh, the technique and building capability, capacity, connecting to a network that allows for those activities to be undertaken at, uh, at um, different scales, at bigger scales, all of that's going to be very important and to really clearly uh, draw the connection to how water quality parameters are related to habitat capability, you know, how, how strongly they connect to the needs of, uh, of, of the species that live there and the ecological function that is being supported by the water quality. So that, it's certainly eligible, um, definitely a part of it that we can fund. You know, it may, you may want to take a close look at whether or not it is more sort of what I, I would call hard shell water quality science driven, in which case it's still eligible for funding under wild, but you may wanna look a little harder at the, um, at the small watershed grants track because there's more money in that one and um, it may be that it would be more competitive there. And if you went that route, uh, you know, while it's encouraged, you don't need to provide a, a match for it either. Yeah, I, I think that's that's right, Mike. And um, you know, uh, generally speaking, we don't tend to fund a lot of um, just kind of you know even expanding, but sort of steady state, just kind of straight up monitoring programs that are just about characterizing a resource. The ultimate goal, of really, of of everything that NIFWF does, and certainly our Chesapeake programs, is to accelerate direct conservation and restoration action. So, in the context of like a project like you're considering here. In, and following up on Mike's point, like helping us understand the education component and how those connections and sort of getting more folks involved in water quality monitoring helps to drive greater individual and collective action to address, right, um, sort of the water quality issues that, you know, folks would be finding um, as, as they're doing this monitoring work. Yeah, getting traction on, a, on citizen science you know, kinds of activities, that kind of thing is really up our alley. And, um, you know, as, you know, as was pointed out, um, the, the contribution that that makes to engendering the next generation of conscientious stewards for the bay and the watershed, um, you know, that is going to be pretty key. Mm -hmm. So one of the other projects um, that popped up in the chat was about increasing accessibility to a nature preserve and finding support um, for public access projects like trails and parking areas, where does that kind of fall in the, these spectrums of grants? That's going to be in wild. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that is one of the things that according to the authorizing legislation, the, the enabling legislation um, is called out as a priority. It's one of the, I think, important and unique ways that we can add value to the suite of Chesapeake stewardship fund investments uh, by focusing on that. Uh, and we're really, you know, it's not something that historically has been front and center for the Fish and Wildlife Service either. We've kind of tended to focus on the bugs and the bunnies and the, you know, sustainable ecological processes. Um, but we're, we are not only really eager to fund that kind of work through this new exciting program, but also eager to learn from our colleagues at the National Park Service who do that part of it so much better than we do, uh, you know, um, how we can make those kinds of investments through our program more powerful. And so that's why it's so exciting to think about how we might be able to link and, and cross leverage, you know, gateways grants with wild grants in the future. And thanks, Mike. I, you know, I think a, a way to think about how to knit the public access piece into wild is to um, think about the access being green or blue um, and how it, the way I read it is the, the applications in that category, you're, you're, you're really looking for how is it both providing public access and supporting the natural systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, a project like the one that was put in by the Lancaster Conservancy or, or um, you know, some of the other ones that are access, really thinking about how is it sustainable? How is it resilient? 
Um, if it if you do need parking to be part of the access, how is it green? How is it um, supporting the the local you know green space or waterways? So um, you know having a little bit of a fish lens um, in the public access uh, applications. Yeah, I appreciate that, Wendy. And I think you know part of a maybe a key phrase there is this idea of increasing access um, in a way that's compatible, right, with kind of the, the resource itself and kind of what the goals are for stewarding um, and potentially restoring um, that that resource. And just, you know, we've said it a couple of times, but just, you know, I'll take the opportunity to reinforce again, <clears throat> certainly a potential fit with the WOW program for projects that, that do sort of fit that bucket in terms of increasing public access. Projects are going to be made much more competitive if you can help us understand how it's not just about sort of uh, executing the public access improvements, but sort of what kinds of partnerships and community outreach and engagement exist to be able to make folks know that that access point and is is available, um, the extent to which you're able to also demonstrate you know, how potentially you're you're starting to or, or attempting to get into communities or, or potentially folks that just haven't historically been users in the past. I think that those are going to be things that are going to certainly kind of elevate kind of the, the project in our process. There are, are a few projects in the list that um, are focused on that access and accessibility, and then some that are, are thinking about the access and recreation, but also how do they integrate restoration and conservation into creating that access that sounds like it aligns pretty well. Yes, absolutely. And I think those, the the, the latter bucket, I think are going to be the ones that are going to be a much better fit, much more competitive in our wild program, whereas um, uh, sort of, you know, the, the broader sort of suite of public access needs and approaches, I think, is an example that fits really well with the Gateways Grants Program. Um, a really specific question that popped up into the chat, would boat launch construction along the Chaimung, probably said that wrong, river be covered by any of these grants? It could be. <laughs> um, you know, this isn't really a, a funding source that is intended to support sort of capital improvements for, you know, a, like a boat ramp mm. and a boat ramp alone. Um, but rather a boat ramp in context, um, you know, maybe with some, not not just describing the important need that it may serve um, to a community that has been uh, either denied access in the past or just doesn't have a lot of access available, you know, that's going to be an important element, um, but also to put it again in that conservation context. It's not, you know, it's not just the boat ramp, it's a, it's a boat ramp that um, provides access and um, a, a conception of, of bay stewardship that whether whether or not it includes active restoration in the vicinity of the boat ramp, that's always a nice, nice plus, a nice additive thing. Um, but to have it described in a way that makes it clear how it's contributing to uh, the installation of a conservation ethic in, um, in that part of the watershed, I think is going to be pretty important. And then probably, we probably have time for one or two more questions. One, um, could you clarify or speak to some of the eligible expenses that the funding could be used for? So what are what are the things that the money can actually go towards when they when folks are thinking about putting in their project? What should they be putting in for? I'm interested in a little bit more about what they might be thinking of. I think there's so many things that could be eligible. I would say ineligible things for federal funding being um, no political advocacy, lobbying, all of those pieces that go along with it. Um, but I, I just want to know a little bit more. Um, so Josie put more in the chat. You can also come off mute, Josie, if you would like um, a vendor willing to donate green product to create permeable parking surfaces. So could it be used for the installation of that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And that that project with just the very basic information would be a potentially a fine fit for our small watershed grant program given the stormwater uh, focus. All right. Let's see. 
Maybe one more question. Let's let me go back to our project list. I think we covered the big types of projects that folks shared with us. Um, so last call for any questions that folks might have. I'll yeah. ask a question. Uh, you know, Joe, as you were talking through, your your team is holding. I'm going to call it like open hours or like office hours almost. Proposal labs. Yes, yep. thank you. Can you talk a little bit about those opportunities for folks? Yeah, so, and I can find the link also while I'm kind of sharing, but basically if you have a project idea and you just want to get support from it, um, you're welcome to find time. Basically it looks at my calendar and Jake's calendar and finds open time on it um, for us to talk. And we definitely hope that it also just helps reduce barriers because we're not going back and forth on email so many times. And you can just find a time that works for you to come in and chat with us. Um, and so you'll see that there are two separate um, kind of tracks. You can do the SWIG or the WILD when you go into it. I will say for WILD, we are starting to run low on appointments. And so if there's not a time available, you are welcome to shoot me an email and I'll coordinate because I, I just I know that we're we might be to like the week before it's due before there's more appointments that show up and I don't want to I don't want folks to wait that long um so but it is here um and I encourage you all to just take a moment if you if you have questions if you have thoughts please reach out to us I mean we are here to help you to make your life as easy as we can to run any ideas by us and so um you know we work for Diffwiff, but it's just people behind the behind the scenes here. And so we would love to talk about your project ideas and, and see where it's a fit. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, let's go to what's coming up next, Eddie. Thanks for the great discussions. And yeah, we hope to be putting more of these kinds of resources uh, in front of the network. So stay tuned for additional webinars coming out of our office. Uh, the next one that uh, we uh, can, uh, so you can uh, put hold this date on your calendar is April 6th from 10 to noon. Uh, we'll be uh, doing a little bit deeper dive into refreshing the Chesapeake Gateways network, walking through our framework, uh, and then just talking through the different components of it to add a lot more context to the work that we're going to be doing. So thanks for joining. Uh, any other closing comments from the panelists or uh, folks in the office? Great. Well, thanks, y'all. And uh, yeah, we'll see you at the next one.